I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. This sighting occurred in 1992 on a logging road 10 minutes off the Holberg Road near Georgie Lake, near Port Hardy, B.C. I was fishing with a friend and his dad about 45 minutes from Port Hardy. At the time, my friend's dad was receiving a ticket from the Fish and Wildlife Fuzz. With our fishing privileges being cut short, we decided to go explore. We walked up the top bank down a trail. We then found a sandy slope about 15 feet high with trees and bush at the top. We started throwing rocks at the sand, creating small sand avalanches or sand slides. That's when we both heard a noise above us and both looked up. We both made eye contact with a very human-looking creature with white or gray-looking hair at the forehead. The eyes and nose were similar to an ape's, and the rest of the body was covered in light brown and long hair. The creature was perched over a stump with a large upper body and large hands. Before we realized what we were seeing, the creature went back into the tree line. We finally looked at each other with the realization of what we had just seen and started running. We jumped into the pickup and told the adults we had just seen a bear, and it was big. I don't think the creature was a threat to us, and if anything, it was just being curious. It was about 2 to 4 p.m. and on a bridge crossing a river. This occurred on the Alaska Highway in British Columbia in 1992, around sunset, at Wright Lake, near Fort Nelson. This is northern Canada's gateway to Alaska and Yukon. We were walking along the side of a mountain off the Alaskan Highway when I heard a sudden movement behind me. I turned around to see what kind of animal made the noise, and I saw this great big hairy animal. He must have been nine feet tall. He had dark brown hair and was walking kind of slunched over. I called for my sister and she came over. The thing turned around and looked at us, then walked into the bushes. Amazed at what we had seen, we stood there staring at the trees where he had entered. In August 1993, at Inzana Lake, north of Fort St. James in British Columbia, I had observed a very large hominid walking near the top of a tree line on a clear cut beside the lake. We had noticed tree planters working in the same clear cut for the last five days. This is how I was able to judge the being as having a very large physique. Also noted was the fact that it had a fluid, somewhat athletic gait. Its speed was deceiving because it looked like a person out for a leisurely stroll, yet when I looked back at the point I first saw it there was an amazing amount of ground covered in a short time. Once again, I was able to judge this from watching the tree planters from the days before. I will tell you right now that I'm an avid bear hunter and nobody can tell me that this was a bear because I've hunted and shot every bear season since 1986. Around the 12th to 14th of October 1993 at St. Leon Hot Springs, B.C., myself and three other people were leaving the pool at about 11 p.m. We were walking single file up the steep incline back towards the truck when myself and another male member of the group heard what we assumed to be a bear, approximately 25 to 30 feet to our left. Not wanting the girls to panic, we quietly decided not to tell them and just keep walking to the vehicle. The brush off the trail is fairly thick and would be extremely difficult to get through for a man, but what we were hearing seemed to be moving fairly easily through it and keeping with our stride. As this was a spur-of-the-moment trip, we had no flashlight, but did have a couple of emergency candles one of which I was holding up high at the back of the line with a reflector behind us so we could see where we were going. But unfortunately, it didn't cast the light far enough to see what was in the bush alongside us. At this point, the girls could hear the branches snapping in the bush and inquired what it was. We answered, probably just a bear. As soon as I made that statement, a wail like I've never heard before came from the direction of what we figured was the bear. I spent a lot of time in the bush, and there's no animal that makes a noise like that in the forest. The closest thing I can compare it to is a peacock call, but it was at such a high decibel it actually made our ears vibrate, like when you're in front of a stack of amplifiers at a concert. Then whatever it was turned and ran very quickly down the hill through the bush away from us. The thing was, you could hear that whatever this animal was, it was obviously on two legs, not four and there's no way a man could run through that thick bush that quickly. It scared us all, and we ran to the truck and got in. Funny thing was, we all immediately knew what we had just experienced, but were all reluctant to say what we each thought it was. 
but we finally did and all agreed we had just heard a Sasquatch. I went back the next day, and in the mud around the hot springs, there were numerous prints, very large and manlike. I had no tape measure and no plaster, but they were there. During July 1994, at China Beach on the southwest coast of Vancouver Island, I was spending the day with my friends, and I met a guy who had spent a long time in the summer living on the beach. It was a long beach with dense forest cover all around. He stated that he had seen a Sasquatch about a month before. It had come onto the beach in full daylight before spotting him and then speeding back off into the forest. All I can recall is that he said it was very dark in color. He seemed to be a bit of a hippie type, but all the same, he seemed very sincere. The guy was living on the beach with a bunch of his friends. There was a few of them, women and men, all seemed to be hippie throwbacks as I can remember. But I must stress that the one guy who claimed to have seen the Sasquatch was very sincere. In late August of 1995, I went on a trip to British Columbia for some outdoor adventuring with a friend of mine. One day we took a canoe trip in Lake Kootenai, and after about a half hour of rowing, we decided to go ashore for lunch. We were in a very remote and heavily wooded area of the lake, and we found a small clearing in which we could spread out enough to eat. About five minutes later, we both heard some weird noises coming from what sounded like a couple of hundred feet behind us. We had some hunting knives on us, but nothing else, and my friend was wary in case it was a bear or something. But both of us being the curious types, we decided to push our way through the brush to see what was making the sound. It was like a deep, murmured growl. We could hear the sound getting louder, but couldn't see anything. The brush was really thick, though, and we figured we'd have to be pretty close to see anything. As the sound kept getting louder, we suddenly could smell this disgusting odor, which almost made my eyes tear up. Then all of a sudden, John grabbed my arm and didn't say a word. He just pointed, and before I turned my head, I saw what caused his reaction. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was only 20 feet away at this point, and the reason he hadn't seen it sooner was that it was bent down, kneeling above something. It looked like it was tearing a small animal apart and eating it. It was huge. We were both frozen for a few seconds, and luckily, it did not see us. We then started to back up without turning our backs on it and got to about 50 feet away when it stood up and turned and looked right at us. It was at least 7 or 8 feet tall. I'm 6 foot 4 and I weigh 260 pounds and it was much taller than me. It was covered in dark thick fur similar to a bear. Its face was, for the most part, furry as well with just a bit of black leathery skin on its forehead and cheeks showing through. Its eyes were horrifying. We both thought it was going to kill us. Neither of us could move. We didn't want to turn our backs and run because we were sure it would chase us and catch us in seconds. Then suddenly, it grabbed its dead meal off the ground and turned away from us and ran off into the bush in the opposite direction. Needless to say, we turned and ran as well, straight back to our canoes, and I think the hair on my head was still standing when we got back to civilization and went to a coffee shop to talk about it and try to calm ourselves down. We passed a policeman on our way out of the coffee shop, but we both agreed not to mention it to anyone. We both have good jobs and families and don't want to be looked at as loonies. Anyway, I'll never forget that day, and I know I'll never go in the woods again. At least not in B.C. On September 10, 1995, off a logging road about 10 miles from the toll booth on the Coquihalla Highway, my brother and a friend and I were hunting in the early morning. We were walking up a steep hillside at the end of a logging road. It was early morning and there was a heavy frost on the ground and low-lying trees. When we got to the top of the hill, we got to a small opening. It was a small clearing, probably about one acre in size. By the time we got to the clearing, the sun was up and the light was good. We were just about to continue hiking up the mountain when we began to notice some strange things. The first thing that we noticed was a small tree in the middle of the clearing had been shredded. The tree was more like a tall shrub with many large branches coming off a central trunk. All of the branches had been either bitten off or ripped off at about six feet high. What was even stranger was that the branches were all placed in a neat pile beside the tree. It looked as if it was some sort of bedding material. This got all our attention and we started to look around more. As we were scouring the area, we began to notice large freshly dug holes all around the clearing. Whatever dug the holes, it looked like they were dug with human hands. 
We began finding these holes everywhere, and each of us fanned out to see if we could find more clues. As I got to the edge of the clearing, I noticed a large stump with something on it. It looked almost like a large bouquet of freshly picked grasses, flowers, and other plants. I called my brother and friend over for a look. They were just as bewildered as I was. The three of us are long-time hunters, and we've never seen anything like this before. The area we were hunting was very isolated. There was no human activity near that area, and there was no frost on the small pile of branches, the bouquet of flowers, or the holes. The rest of the clearing had a thick layer of frost. Whatever had done this had to have been there just before we got there. We thought that whatever was there heard us coming and left the area. I've always been interested in the Bigfoot phenomenon, but my brother had always been a skeptic. I can tell you from that day, all three of us believe that Bigfoot exists. Driving to work from Nelson to Caslow, B.C., which is approximately 45 miles, I came around the corner on about a half-mile stretch of highway at about 7.40 a.m. when I noticed something crawling up the left side of the bank. At first I thought it was a bear, but when it got to the top of the highway shoulder, it stood up, and that's when I really took a hard look and noticed that it was at least 7 to 8 feet tall and dark in color. It then turned and looked down the highway at me, and at this time I was about a quarter of a mile away, when it took one stride to the center of the highway, which is 12 feet, and then a second stride to the other side of the road, and then a third stride across the ditch, and then a final stride to the edge of the timber line, where it stopped and turned, and it looked to be covered in hair. As it walked across the highway, it was slouched over slightly. I ended up driving a mile past the sighting before it hit me that I had seen something out of the ordinary, and because I was running late for work, I thought I would stop by on the way home. It ended up raining all day, and when I finally got back to the site, things were pretty well packed down with the rain, so there was no footprints. It was coming down from the mountain and possibly heading to Kootenai Lake, or possibly a cave. In the fall of 1995, a sighting occurred on the east side of Princess Royal Island, about mid-island. The island is approximately 400 kilometers long and is 2 kilometers from the mainland. The incident was told to a forestry technician by his co-worker, and he vouched for her that she doesn't BS or tell lies and was shaken up about the incident. She went by float plane to check on a spacing project on an old cut block harvested in the 1970s. The spacers had finished the project, and she was alone on the site. She was finished checking the site and was walking out of the block on an old road at approximately 4 p.m. in the afternoon. She was walking down a hill and noticed something watching her. She turned around and saw a tall furry animal, dark brown with long arms, taking two strides and hiding behind a boulder. When it walked, it had bent knees. It was not a bear. She was spooked and took out her bear mace and took off toward the beach, which was the pickup spot, at a good pace. The same technician relayed a story she found in the Prince Rupert paper. Two fishermen hit a rock in a storm and bailed out of the sinking fishing boat in a lifeboat. They made it to Banks Island, 100 kilometers from Kitimat, B.C. They radioed out for rescue help and spent a couple of days on Banks Island waiting for rescue. Late one evening, they saw a Bigfoot walking on the beach. Then, one night, one came to check out their camp. They noticed large tracks around their camp, but they didn't hear the Bigfoot. That incident happened in the fall of 1993. What I observed occurred in 1987 or 88. I was 8 or 9 years old at the time and in Langley, B.C., in Canada. I saw a very tall, ape-like, brown creature with long hair walking hunched forward. The creature turned and looked at me and another man who had been living in that house as our tenant. The man ran off to his car and sped away, but I couldn't because my dad was working on changing the front lock and he didn't see the creature. The creature ducked down slightly and entered the barn we had southwest of the house, maybe two or three hundred feet from me. The thing that sticks out in my memory the most is the hunched over gate and the way it turned toward me and observed me, right in the eyes. It wasn't really scary, but I was frightened when it looked at me in the eyes for a few seconds and made no other gesture. It was sunny, the temperature was pleasant, around high noon. Visibility was clear to the mountains. The area was woods and open field. The creature came out of the woods and walked in plain sight across a field into the barn. On June 15, 1986, near Gibson's Landing on the Sunshine Coast, me and my friend had been hiking up the mountain trail on Cemetery Road. 
The time was around 11 a.m. There were low clouds that day. We hiked up and down this trail many times. On the way up that day, we observed a black-colored animal. As we walked to the spot where we saw the back of the animal touch a branch of a tree, we discovered it must have been 9 to 10 feet tall. We didn't get a good look at this creature, but could smell a wet dog-like smell. We saw a trail that the animal had made, so we walked through it and came out under some cedar trees. We noted huckleberry leaves on the ground made into a bed. Whatever made this, we knew it was not from any man or bear. On March 14, 1987, four men working at night at an oil well in an isolated clearing at Fellers Heights in British Columbia noticed a Bigfoot skulking around behind the trees. The creature was seven feet tall and it was peering at them and circling around the work site. Its legs were too long for a bear. It was still winter and bears were still hibernating anyway. The footprints left in the snow were the size of size 18 shoes and were six feet apart. Knee prints were also found in the snow that were three feet apart. Feller's Heights is near Dawson Creek. This encounter occurred between Trail and Castlegar. Near Christmas of 1980, my father and his friend decided to go snowmobiling about 9 p.m., and as my uncle was up visiting from Calgary, I asked if we could tag along on my smaller sled. We unloaded the sleds and took off up Haddikins Mill Road to try and get to Nancy Green Lake. It started snowing quite heavily, and my father and his friend were getting bogged down trying to break trail into the lake. We turned the sleds around to head back, and my dad said him and his friend were going to just race back to the truck, and for me and my uncle to just putt back. I was about four miles down the fresh tracks when my uncle asked to drive. We switched spots, and he made it to the first corner and put the sled into a burn pile on the left side of the trail, getting us stuck. While we were tramping a trail down in front of the sled, we both started to smell something very strong, like rotten meat, and my uncle went into hysterics, crying and screaming bear. I, being a hunter since I was five, knew bears should be hibernating, but that smell was making me scared too. I started the snowmobile and wriggled it back on the fresh trail to see what I thought was an old trapper run from behind the burn pile across the trail and through the bush, shaking all the snow off the trees as he went. My uncle jumped on the sled and I went about 30 yards ahead where the creature ran and saw a large bear footmark on the trail in front of me and the steps through probably four feet of powdered snow. About 10 or so miles down the trail, my dad was coming back to check on us, and upon stopping, he could see we were very shaken, and I told him there was a poor old trapper up on the trail with no boots on. I explained where the incident occurred, and I went back to the truck. When my dad returned to the truck, he explained to me about the Sasquatch, and that it wasn't an old trapper in a fur coat that I witnessed. I remember the trapper only seemed about my dad's height, six foot, and had on a very long fur coat covered with snow. I couldn't see much else for details because of the heavy snow and darkness. My dad seen the marks in the snow, minus the clear one on the trail as I ran it over, but definitely said it was walking on two legs, and they were quite long as there wasn't really any drag marks from where it walked through the deep snow. I've had another personal encounter in roughly this same area about seven years later while deer hunting. It involved a large, same-smelling animal that did the scariest scream-like yell all night above a cabin me and a couple of buddies were spending the night in. During July 1985 near Revelstoke, B.C., I was driving my pickup truck on the Trans-Canada Highway on my way to Kelowna. I was alone at the time, but I had a friend half hour in front of me and some friends 15 minutes behind me. I saw this very large, man-like animal cross the road about three to 400 feet in front of me. It came up the side of the ditch, and it almost looked like it looked to make sure there were no cars coming. It looked right at me and then crossed the road and went down the other side of the ditch. It was about eight to nine feet tall, with very big shoulders, long arms, and had orangey-brown hair. It had to have been seven to nine hundred pounds, if not more. It crossed the road with big, long strides. I looked in the bush where it went. I was going to wave some people down, but it was moving way too fast, and there were just too many trees and it was gone. My father's friend was a firefighter and spotted one some 30 years ago from his chopper. It occurred about 6.30 to 7 on a nice summer morning in a pine forest with thick brush. This occurred on March 15, 1998, near Port Alberni. I was out camping on Vancouver Island near the Strathcona Park on the Port Alberni side of the mid-mountain range of the island. 
Just before dark, I heard a loud crashing noise coming up from the creek toward my camp, the first such noise I had heard in three weeks of camping. I thought it was a bear. I didn't have my rifle with me, so I made a lot of noise banging pots and pans together. The bear went away. In about ten minutes or so, a long, drawn-out scream of something came from across the lake. I've been a woodsman all my life, and I'm familiar with all the various animals on the island and what they sound like. I never heard that sound before or since. I had a strange occurrence on January 21, 1996. I live in McBride, B.C., five miles out near a forestry road that goes back into the wilderness. I don't really know if this was Sasquatch-related or not, but after I mentioned the story to some other neighbors, I was told there were sightings reported near here about two miles away and that there were more than one occurrence. The morning was still very dark out and it was warm for winter. It was even raining off and on. It was somewhere around 6 to 6.30 a.m. I heard a noise outside. It was the freezer lid as we had our freezer outside because we lived with a generator for power and had it outside along the back wall so the snow didn't cover it too badly. Anyway, I know that the lid was very heavy as I had a tarp that covered it and I had had many problems lifting it. I usually had to wait for my husband to get things out for me. It was just too heavy. After I heard this, I couldn't figure out what would lift this lid or who, but it was dark and I was a little shaken. I waited till it was very light out and I went to look at the freezer. I didn't find anything, but decided to see if there were footprints around. I didn't find prints until I went to the front driveway about 50 feet from our house. There, I found two bare footprints, but only two. I got a ruler and measured the prints at 13 and a half inches. They were very wide. The stance of the prints were 22 inches apart. I went and woke up my daughter to take a look. She was about 15 at the time. Didn't say a thing except showing her what I found. She just laughed at me and said, I suppose you think these are Sasquatch tracks. I shrugged my shoulders and said, I don't know, you tell me. It was really mild weather at that time and it was raining. Later, I decided how strange this was and thought about taking a picture because no one will ever believe me. By the time I decided to take the pictures, the prints had melted a lot. I thought it was too bad that I didn't think of the camera earlier. I was told later that a neighbor had had several encounters, but didn't like to let it be known. We live on Eddy Creek near Forestry Roads, about a quarter of a mile from the mountain cliffs where there are caves. I have not seen a Sasquatch, However, I was in a location that is notorious for Sasquatch sightings, which has made me look back at an experience I had in February of 1996. We were on a camping trip on the northeast side of Harrison Lake, B.C. We were basically in the middle of nowhere on a nine-day camping trip with a Chevy pickup and a camper on the back. I went out one night to chip ice off the side of the river for our drinks and had an eerie feeling of being watched. I quickly ran back to our camper. That night, I woke to our camper being rocked slightly, and I heard a very deep sniffing sound, as though something was outside smelling all around the truck. Our bed was located in the camper above the cab of the truck, and whatever it was, was tall enough that its nose was at that level. I froze in fear. My husband was sleeping soundly and never noticed anything. We'd been there for a number of days at that point, and all the snow around our camp spot was trampled down to a hard-packed ice, so I found no tracks. I will never forget that, nor will I ever return there again. It makes the hair on my neck stand on end to this day. I would like to share with you an experience I had in the summer of 1996 that was most unusual. In the summer of 96, I became slightly lost while hiking with my then four-year-old son on Reed Island. I left the wooden path and decided to walk along an old logging road, thinking that if I followed it long enough in any one direction, I would eventually reorientate and find our camp. The island was not that large. We stopped at the roadside to pick some wild berries. It was approximately 2 p.m. I heard what sounded like quite distinctly, like a hiker walking swiftly through the thick brush approaching behind the thicket of berries. Being lost, I called out, feeling relieved that I was about to encounter another person. The footsteps stopped quite suddenly after I called out. I had the strange sensation of being watched. The footsteps began again, but slower. I called out again, but became anxious because it sounded as though whoever it was was sneaking up on me. I was scared it was some hermit freak. 
I felt very vulnerable and started to back away from the berry bushes into the middle of the road. Then whatever it was behind those bushes emitted a surreal noise that I find difficult to describe but cannot forget. It was a very loud, deep growl that became almost a roar. I grabbed my son's hand and ran as fast as we both could. It was my understanding that occasionally a bear will swim onto the islands. But the noise of whatever was moving through the bush did not seem like the big slow noises a bear would make. I've had bears wander into my camp before, and you can usually really hear them coming if the brush is thick. Anyway, there it is. That's my story. I have always been a believer in Sasquatch. However, I was never wanting to actually see one. I watched a documentary when I was 10 years old and had bad dreams ever since. In one dream, he cornered me in a cave and threw a big log at me. This woke me thinking I was dead. Anyway, my wife and I and two kids went camping at a provincial park near our home. It was in the middle of June. One afternoon, my wife convinced me to go for a hike down one of the trails nearby. We walked down the road a hundred foot, we walked down the road a hundred feet, and turned onto the trail that went straight into the bush behind the camp. About two hundred feet down the trail, I was looking up a hill that was covered in ferns. There were not many trees for about fifty yards. The sun was shining on this hill. The trees were very tall, so not much direct sunlight got through in most places. My camera was still in the bag at this point. Then I noticed what looked like a big stump at the back of the sunlit area. All of a sudden, it got up and started running away very quickly. It ran about a hundred yards in my view, away from the direction of my campsite. I was able to see its foot when it came up to the back, and it didn't look huge compared to the rest of him. I saw a long thigh come up level as it ran. It was very muscular in the back. I could see how the hair came to a V-shape at the spine. The color was like a grizzly bear. The last thing I heard was a big crack of a tree. I looked at my wife and said, let's go. Then I picked up my smallest boy and we ran to the road. My wife and kids saw nothing. They weren't even looking. I then saw a parks guy emptying garbage cans. I went to him and said, I just saw something big and brown in the bush. To my surprise, he quite calmly said, was it on two legs or four legs? I responded, two. He said, okay, I'll tell the rangers. And that was it. He didn't seem surprised or disbelieving. I went back with the camera to find tracks and found a rotten log all torn up where I first saw it, and in the soft ground there were scratch marks where tracks would have been. Then I found deep tracks 15 inches long where it ran. I'm six foot three and had to jump between them. We went back a year later in the fall with my father and tried a different trail close by where we noticed another ripped up log and several large stones on the side of the trail that were overturned. The park was closed at the time, and you would have needed a machine to do that. My dad said he thought he could smell a horse sweating. I said, that's enough for me. I'm out of here. On July 2, 1999, I worked on a wildfire near the town of Golden in British Columbia. The fire was about 180 kilometers off the main highway. It was in this remote location we were flown by helicopter to the top of the Alpine above this fire. Once landed, we waited for the chopper to return with some equipment for us. Myself and my buddy went to go check for a water source for our pumps. We found a small patch of snow on the Alpine, and in the middle of it, we noticed there was a footprint. The strange thing about it is that there was only one in the middle of this snow patch that was about 30 feet wide and 20 to 25 feet long. It was approximately 12 to 15 inches long, and you could clearly see all the toes still. There's no way someone could have made this because of the location we were in. This happened at approximately 8.45 a.m., just off the Hope-Princeton Highway at Nicolum Creek, about six miles east of Hope, B.C. I had entered a small access road to an abandoned gravel pit about 100 yards from the highway. I was looking for firewood to load onto my pickup to take to a campground some distance away. I knew that the road maintenance crew frequently dumped fallen trees and the occasional roadkill near this location. After leaving my vehicle, I had walked about 150 yards along the edge of a steep-sided gully when I noticed a large, dark, reddish-brown animal at the bottom of the gully, about 50 yards away. It seemed to be standing on its hind feet, scratching or digging at something in the small bushes. Having its back toward me and its head obscured by overhanging foliage, 
I noticed the fur seemed to be longer on the back and that the underside of its paws or hands were light-colored. Having respect for and heeding warnings about meeting grizzly bears in the wild, I decided to quickly return to my vehicle. At this time, the animal must have sensed me and it turned in my direction. I still was not able to see its head or face because of the tree branches. Moving hurriedly toward my truck, I glanced back over my shoulder in time to see the animal climbing up over the steep slope of the opposite side of the gully on two legs and seemed to be pulling itself up by grasping the bushes and trees with its hands. I had the impression this animal had a small head for its bulk, unlike a bear, which has a large head for its size. It moved rapidly up the slope and disappeared into a stand of lodgepole pine at the top edge of the gully. I had the impression it moved in a hominoid fashion. I don't to this day know what it was, but it was the closest thing to a Sasquatch I've ever had the opportunity or privilege to see. This occurred in March 1967 on Badger Mountain in Benton County, Washington. I was hunting on Badger Mountain, five miles south of Richland, Washington, on a cool spring, partly overcast day. I was looking through binoculars from its summit when I noticed from the valley floor looking south a large, extremely hairy, seven and a half to eight foot ape-like creature, walking, then suddenly running at a pace that no human could match. I followed it for four to five minutes until it disappeared into a little ravine with a creek bed running through it. Five years earlier, in 1962, I began hunting east of Richland, Washington, by the delta of the Yakima River, where it empties into the mighty Columbia River. It was in the middle of winter time, with the weather being close to five degrees, and I encountered massive footprints that were made in the snow. I estimated that time of the weight being between 500 to 1,000 pounds. On looking back of my two encounters, I'm a firm believer that not only does Bigfoot exist, but he is using all of our natural resources to his advantage for food and shelter. In August 1967, on Fort Lewis, we were on an escape and evasion training area in Thurston County, Washington. Three large individuals, two very large and the other about two-thirds their size, were seen. When we first saw the individuals, they were on the far side of an open meadow. I remember that there was a bright moon out because we could see features such as trees and objects well enough to run without tripping. That is where we saw the individuals. At first we thought they were the capture team looking for us. They were back in the tree line when we first saw them. There was a road not far behind them and we could see what we thought were soldiers moving very slowly. When they breached the tree line, Mickles decided that we had had enough space between us and them to escape if they were part of the capture team. He thought it might be some like ourselves who escaped earlier and got out of the boundary area. Mickles got up and started walking toward them and I followed. There were just silhouettes, but as we got closer, Mickles waved at them, then they started moving towards us, faster, not really running, just faster. Mickles called to them and they came faster without answering. I've never heard of bears walking upright, and for sure, not that fast, but I didn't know that much about bears. I did know that something wasn't right, and I was really scared. I really didn't think they were bears or people. I don't know why. I just know I have never been that terrified, and so was Mickles. We ran as fast as we could without looking back, but felt like they were gaining on us. I told Mickles to follow me and crawled up under a large low pine tree. We just laid there. We could feel their presence, but didn't dare move. That's when we smelled this weird smell. I'm sorry, I can't describe it to you. It was strong is all I can say. We stayed there for probably 15 minutes and then I said, let's head out for the road, and we did. By that time, the maneuver was over and we saw a bus pull up by the compound. We ran as fast as we could and caught the bus. We never looked back except in memory. I've hunted all over the U.S. from Colorado to Illinois to Texas. What we saw the silhouettes of and smelled was not humans or any bear. They had an unusually strong odor, and they made no sounds. I have thought about the incident many times in the past. At the time, neither Mickles or myself ever heard of Bigfoot. In Marietta, in September 1967, there were many groups of witnesses and individual witnesses during the salmon run on the Nooksack River. 
there was at least eight sightings of a tall, hairy humanoid that was seven feet tall and left footprints 17 inches long, as well as leaving a foul smell. The man-beast had gray-tipped hair and glowing eyes. It occasionally raided fishing nets while the farmers were fishing. The hairy humanoids in the Northwest were certainly quite busy during the salmon run that year. This encounter occurred in the fall of 1967, south of Winlock, a couple of miles, on the old Brinson Place, which was abandoned. This was in Lewis County in Washington, during the school year. Some high school kids had parked in the driveway to the abandoned farm, the old Brinson Place, for an evening of drinking beer or some kind of sexual encounter, or both. They were probably necking or drinking in a car, when they observed a tall animal standing erect observing them. It was white or perhaps gray with red eyes. This occurred on more than one occasion. When the word of the Brinson monster got around, some other kids went out there with a rifle, probably a 30-30, in an attempt to kill it. It was spotted again and a shot was fired, but it just kept on moving. That was the last time it was seen in the area. The incident caused some activity at the high school. There were stories and poems written about it in English class, but that, surprisingly, was about it. We didn't know about Bigfoot or Sasquatches in those days, and people didn't know what to make of it. Also, about this time, some friends and I were camped out at the top of Sam Henry Mountain, about five miles west of Winlock. Shining a flashlight across from one hilltop to the next, we saw a lot of eye shine reflected back from unknown large animals. During the night, I remember hearing a loud branch break. It makes me wonder now what caused that, considering deer aren't usually so clumsy. In the fall of 1967, three miles east of Spirit Lake near Randall in Skamania County, Washington, my grandfather, whom was familiar with this region and hunted this mountain country yearly by horseback, saw what I believed to be a Pacific Northwest Sasquatch. Although he never would say for sure what he really thought of the incident, he was very humble, except that he had seen something eye to eye that he felt confident few men had ever seen, and he conveyed a deep feeling of respect for the creature. My grandfather rarely spoke of the incident, but he felt safe telling my father the details. Those who don't believe in the creature probably never had a reason to feel otherwise, but my grandfather was an honest, humble outdoorsman who knew the back country of Washington, Idaho, and Oregon very well. He saw a Sasquatch that fall day in 1967. In Candy Pass in the Washington Cascades in Chelan County near Little Wenatchee River, on a morning in November 1967, Fred Callison spotted a tall, hairy humanoid in the sights of his 30 6 rifle at the range of 75 yards. The creature was 7 half feet tall, appeared to weigh 400 pounds, and had bowed legs. The long arms were almost reaching its knees, and it had sloping shoulders and reddish hair all over its body. The man-beast had small, dark eyes that stared at the witness. The creature also had black hair on its head, a broad, flattened nose, and protruding lips and chin. The man and the man-beast faced each other for five seconds, and then it left, leaving footprints that were 15 inches long and 7 inches across the ball of the foot, and were one and a half inches deep. Frank knew that it was not a bear, and he could not bring himself to shoot it. The creature made a grunting noise. This occurred on August 30, 1968, near Icicle River Road, near Leavenworth in Chelan County, Washington. After arriving at the lake, we set up camp and heard screams a couple of times that we thought were mountain lions. An hour or two after we went to bed, I was still awake because the rest of the group hadn't made it to the lake, and I was worried about them. A windbreak of poles about six feet tall was beside us, and a head was moving along the far side of it. I thought it was one of our group. When it got to the far end of the windbreak, it squatted down and began going through my backpack. This didn't bother me because I thought that one of our group needed something. I said, you finally made it. It stood up, and at this point, I realized it was a foot or two higher than the windbreak. Between the moon and what was left of the fire, I could see what I learned some years later, people were calling Bigfoot. It then turned and walked away into the night. In the morning after a sleepless night, I went to my pack and noticed that it wasn't torn, but my stuff was all over the ground. The part of the story that seems to make people not believe me is that the only thing gone was the Oreo cookies. The package was there, but no cookies. 
I didn't see the thing eat them, but I don't know how else they could have disappeared. When the rest of the group showed up, I told them the story and the adult said that it had to be a bear, only it wasn't. Someone made some comment about a Bigfoot, but neither I or anyone else believed that either at the time. Later in the day, we were walking around the lake to where the screams came from the night before. The slope was formed by some very large rocks. On one large slab-like stone formed a sort of cave under it. Inside, at the far end, was some brush and maybe grass. There was hair on the brush that looked to be black. Everyone decided it was a bear den, and that was what I had seen the night before. Some years later, while working with my dad in someone's house, I noticed a magazine with a kind of silhouette of a Sasquatch on the cover. I think it was called The Year of the Sasquatch or something like that. I looked inside on the sightings page, and in the Kolchak Lake area, there was a bunch of dots indicating sightings. That's when I allowed myself to believe that maybe these things do exist. Two Darrington area boys didn't believe in Bigfoot Sunday of last week, but during the next 24 hours, they became firm believers. After returning from a week-long camping trip, they reported that three of the mysterious creatures chased them from Cub Lake, high above the Suatl River, to within a few hundred yards of their camp, about a mile away. Mark Meese, 16, and Marshall Cabe, 14, were among eight teenagers who hiked from Downey Creek Campground to the Downey Creek and Bachelor Creek Trails Monday, August 4, 1969. At 6.30 p.m., the boys made camp less than a mile from Cub Lake. After dinner, Mark and Marshall volunteered to hike to Cub Lake and Itswood Lake to scout for fish. It was on their return that they spotted the first of the creatures across Cub Lake. I asked Mark what it was that, Marshall said. Mark at first thought it was a big bear or just a snag. But then the creatures made a come-on gesture with its arm and two more of them came into sight. As the boys watched, the three creatures started around the lake toward them. The boys said the three animals stood on their hind legs and ran like men. They looked more like well-built men than apes, Mark said. He said their arms came to about their knees. They were covered with long black hair, except on their faces. Their heads dipped in and out at the forehead, Mark said. Both boys said the creatures were 10 to 11 feet tall and moved with great ease. With the creatures coming after them, the two boys ran up a rock slide that sloped away from the lake. Halfway up, they looked back to see that the three creatures, about 50 yards behind, had spread out as if to surround them. They said, We were both scared. We were shaking, Marshall said. We told each other goodbye. We thought we were going to die. The three creatures called to each other with a high-pitched sound, according to the boys. At the top of the ridge, above the lake, the boys dropped down to the camping area where their six friends were. At first they didn't believe us, Mark said, but they saw how white and panicky we were, then they did. Both boys feel that it was the sight or the smell of the campfire that kept the creatures from pursuing them down the ridge. Marshall said, I have never believed in it. Now I don't care what anyone says. I know it wasn't a bear. I know what I saw, Mark said. I've never seen anything like it before. Most of the group returned to Darrington Thursday after fishing in Downey Creek. None of them ventured to Itswood Lake, as they had originally planned. Robert Taylor, district ranger in Darrington, district of Mount Baker National Forest, said this morning that his office had received reports of the incident, but not taking it too seriously. He said he would not send anyone into the area, especially to investigate the report, but if we have anyone going up that way, we'll ask them to take a look around. He said the district has never had a report of such strange creatures. On July 27, 1969, at 2.35 a.m., Deputy Sheriff Verlin Harrington was driving home along D.K. Road near Copalis Beach when he saw an eight-foot-tall hairy humanoid that was standing in the middle of the road in front of his car. Verlin hit the brakes hard to avoid hitting it and got out of the car with a spotlight. Verlin aimed his spotlight at it, cocked his pistol, and was ready to shoot. The creature had a human-like face and was covered with dark brown hair, except for the feet and the hands, and ran away. The hair on the head was longer than the rest of the body, at five to seven inches long. The creature also had breasts, but unlike other Bigfoot reports, these were with hair on them, except around the black nipples. The face was black, and the fingers, face, and buttocks were like a human's. 
the creature appeared to weigh 300 pounds. Next day, footprints 18 inches long by 7 inches wide were found. In North Bonneville in Skamania County, in November 1969, Mrs. Louise Baxter saw a hairy humanoid crossing the road in front of her car. It was daytime and she got a good look. She described the creature as having coconut-colored brown hair that was shaggy and dirty. The mouth had large square teeth set into a big head set right onto the shoulders with apparently no neck and there was hair two inches long on the head. The creature had a protruding chin, a receding forehead, a wide nose with big nostrils and glowing amber eyes. This occurred on November 15, 1969. My name is S.H. At the time of the sighting, I was attending WSU, and I had to return home from college for some things I needed to take care of. I left Pullum late in the afternoon and didn't get to the White Pass area until sometime after 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning. I was coming down the west side of the pass and was just past the Chinook Pass cut off and was headed around the big sweeping corner that was near the bottom of the hill when my headlights picked up on the right side of the car, something moving and coming up the side of the road. Since this was a bank, I first saw the head, and then as it moved up the bank, more of its body became visible. It did not look at me or the headlights of the car. I slowed down as I wasn't sure what it was going to do and moved into the left-hand lane. I remember thinking, what is that? Is that a bear? No, but I had no explanation of what I was seeing. As I slowed down, the animal, which was standing on two legs, stepped over the guardrail and turned to start walking up the hill. It didn't seem startled or scared or frightened. It was like I wasn't even there. The size of it must have been eight feet tall or taller, as the guardrail was of little difficulty for the animal to step over. It seemed to be moving with a purpose. The animal was completely covered with hair with long arms. It did not have the typical bear head and pointed nose, nor did it look like an ape either. Its movements were very graceful and smooth, and as I mentioned, walked upright. The hair on the animal in the headlights seemed black, but with brown highlights. The whole sighting probably lasted no more than 15 seconds. As I passed by in the lane, it had turned to walk up the hill. As I drove down the road, I tried to rationalize what I just saw. It was not a bear or an ape like we see in the zoo. I've often thought, was I seeing things, having driven so far without stopping? But still, I am clear I saw something that I've never seen before. I've lived at Scenic, near Stevens Pass, Washington, in the 1960s to 70s. There had been sightings of Sasquatch near our home, and at the time my husband and I laughed about that and never took them seriously. I lived at Scenic about 10 years and enjoyed taking walks with myself and my Samoyed dog. That dog would chase bears away, run them up trees. I always felt safe with her around. One morning, the dog went with my husband to work, and I decided to take a walk down to the end of the road toward Highway 2. It was a beautiful spring day, and the snow still lay in places on the ground. I can still see and hear this like it was yesterday. I had crossed the small bridge going over the small creek by our place and gotten almost to the end of the road where it meets the highway. That's when I heard the most god-awful sound... I can still hear it in my mind. The sound was quite close to me. I'm thinking about half a block distance and seemed to be coming around the area where the deserted railroad bunkhouses and depot were. The creature had huge lungs. The volume was immense. I'm trying to think of a word for the sound. It was that shrill pitch, a pause of three seconds and another sound. That was it. And since I don't believe in Sasquatch, I wasn't scared of it, just curious. I knew all the calls of the animals around our mountains, and it wasn't the same. I've tried all these years to figure out what made that noise. I stopped into the Forest Service office after this happened and asked them if they've ever heard this sound. I was trying to explain to them the best I could, but they never took me seriously. I received the same response from my friends that live in Skycomish. Then after I moved to Spokane some time later, I was watching Unsolved Mysteries. They played a sound that sounded very similar to and I said to myself, that's the sound, or closest to it. I thought, no one's going to believe this. I worked in a hospital in Spokane, and one of my Indian patients and I got to talking about my experience. She said she had seen a Sasquatch come into her camp as a young girl and chased it away by beating on a drum. She said the most astounding thing she remembers about her experience was the human look in its eyes. 
The next day, I checked the area where the bunkhouses were, and I saw and heard nothing more. A year or two before I heard that sound, there were kids from the University of Washington that said they had seen a Sasquatch. They were looking around above our house at Scenic, going through a railroad tunnel, looking for it. My husband and I were out for a walk and noticed these huge boulders rolling down the mountainside. My husband and I were looking up toward the mountain, wondering what was going on. I said to him, what the heck is going on up there? He laughed, saying, the fool kids said they saw a Sasquatch and are looking for it. Now, I'm not too sure that was them. An Associated Press dispatch printed in various newspapers on June 17th and 18th, 1970, reports that three teenage girls claimed to have been chased in their car three weeks previously by a seven-foot Sasquatch which left 16-inch tracks in a seven-foot stride. The father of one of the girls, Russell Figg, a deputy sheriff of Grays Harbor, investigated unofficially. The sighting took place between Copalis Crossing and Carlisle near the site of the sighting last year by Deputy Verlin Harrington. Tracks led to a lean-to near where a number of old cow skulls were found. Several researchers are said to have investigated this occurrence. Dick Grover of Everett, Washington, writes on June 24th, On June 17th, Dick Tierney paid us a visit. We took a drive over to Pacific Beach to check out the latest sighting up here in Washington State. We visited the Fig residence, where we were met cordially. Mrs. Fig said she and her son found an area where nine skulls were scattered all about. This was in the same general vicinity where the girls saw a creature that was at least seven feet tall jumping up and down in a ditch. As soon as they passed it, it jumped onto the roadway and they could see the bulkiness of it as it began chasing their car down the road. The skulls were scattered all around a large tree stump and later were identified as cow skulls. The year was 1970, and my friend John and I rode my Honda 90 along logging roads to a secluded area which was about seven miles from my family's cabin on the Toodle River. I remember the year because John had just graduated from high school and was working at Longview Logging and Mill Supply, and I was about to enter my junior year of high school. Anyway, it was summer, and we were camping in my father's old army pup tent, when we heard what sounded like several apes screaming. We both agreed that that was the best description of the sound. It was fairly dark, and we looked out of the tent and saw a large dark silhouette about 150 feet from the front of the tent. John had a single-shot 22 rifle, and I had a Winchester gallery gun, also in 22 caliber. What we saw we thought was a Bigfoot, and we shouted out several warnings to whoever or whatever was there that we were going to begin shooting. After getting no response, we pumped several rounds into it, and it did not move. We finally got brave enough to go out and investigate, only to learn it was an old tree stump from when the area was logged by McCormick Brothers in the late 1800s or early 1900s. Although the stump was not a Bigfoot, we both heard that most chilling screaming, which must have lasted 45 seconds to a minute. My best guess is that the sound originated less than 300 yards away yet the nearest farm or house or cabin was about one to two miles away. This event happened near Suquamish in King County in Washington. I really don't know if it was a Bigfoot encounter or not, but I don't know how else to explain it. I was between 9 and 11 years old. There were woods all around where I lived, and I spent most of my time playing in them. There was an old road, passable only to bikes, horses, and four-wheel drives, that led to power lines and a popular camping and party spot. It was a dense forest, and no direct sunlight came through the canopy. As my friend and I walked and talked, all of a sudden, there was a loud growling and screaming sound, about 50 or so feet in front of us. And whatever it was, moved that tree enough to let the sunlight in. These were big trees, and it seemed like the earth was shaking a bit too. We stopped dead in our tracks, just long enough for the adrenaline to kick in, and then we ran as fast as we could for the whole half mile out of the woods. It's been a long time, and I was young, but the vision is pretty clear of the trees moving and the bright sunlight. I told my family about it at the dinner table, and they said it was probably just somebody trying to scare us, but I never really accepted that. And my friend and I had never spoken about it again. It has plagued me my whole life. Just writing this, I remember the fear like it was yesterday. At Vader in Lewis County, Washington, on the 4th of December, 1970, 
Mrs. Wallace Bowers hears her children calling her to come outside. They had discovered footprints in one-inch deep snow that were 16 inches long by 5 to 7 inches wide and so heavy that the animal had broken through the snow with every step, leaving one and a half inch deep impressions in the gravel below. The family dog had been acting oddly the night before. Also in Vader that December in 1970, several individuals witnessed a hairy humanoid that left footprints. There was also UFOs seen in the sky that resembled bright lights and that hovered over power lines. Here's that story. On December 7th, Witnesses saw a bright star move across the sky. The star then flew closer to the witnesses, and they saw that it had a center dome around which a large circle was revolving. It had a deep orange center and a definite bright rim and was tipped sideways. The craft hovered over the Bonneville power lines with its color changing from orange to bright and clear. It made one last sweep closer, again turning orange, and the children saw a gray shape drop from it. From then on, every night between 2 and 3 a.m., thudding sounds were heard going across the yard. Yet the house was so well insulated that you cannot even hear a car coming down the drive. Thanks for listening. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.